Dr. John. This is Big Time Baby. Welcome to the Jason Wright Show. I'm so glad you're here. What's up, man? Thank you so much for having me, Jason. You're so great. Well, this is an honor. And I, okay, so like I just mentioned before we came online, this book that I want to spend, I know that we're limited on time. I could keep you here all day, but I know we've got a short window. This book, redefining anxiety is where i want to land it's i, I want to but i want you to take us off to kind of get us to because i think so much of your personal story led you to this book that's what i gathered from the book and just what i know about you and so kind of bring us is take us as far back as you want and then lead us up to redefining anxiety and then i want to dig into this thing as you can see there's tabs for the for the for the listener that can't see there's Go almost as many tabs as there are pages in that book man it's really sad. Well, every page, I told you, man, it's the first time I have ever written in the margins of a book, Power Statement. I mean, you brought it, baby. You hey, brought it. Thank it was, you, dude. So let's go. How did it start? How did we land there? So I'm a, I'm a Houston native, grew up, born and raised in Houston. My old man was a SWAT guy and a homicide detective. And then my mom was um, the, the, the family of origin she came from. Women were not had no business going to college. They had a job to do and that was going to be to take care of a house. And that was it. So uh, I think it was eighth grade, ninth grade for me. My mom took one community college class and then she took another one there at Kingwood community college in North Houston. And then she kept going and kept going and suddenly looked up and my dad had transitioned from being a um, detective and kind of the stud with Houston police department to being a, a minister at a large church. And then my mom had worked on one community college, another community college class, another one. Then she went to University of Houston, ended up graduating with her PhD at 57, became a tenured professor at 62. So I have this model of two things. One, if things get bananas, get off the rails, you go in, you don't run, right? That's, right. that's what I picked up from my old man. And you smile when you do it, man, because that's where life's adventures are. It's probably going to get you killed, but it's going to be a good time on the way. And then my mom's um, and dad, there is never, there's such a thing as age. There's such a thing as you can't do it. And so I grew up with those two models, not talked about, you know, a lot of parents tell their kids, you can do anything. I watched it happen, awesome. which I think is the, is the best way to learn. So long story short, that was an awesome model. And it was untethering because there wasn't a, this path. And so I tried to jump on as many different paths as I could. And ultimately it was you got to make this much money. You got to you got to have a house that looks like this. You got to have jobs look like this. And man, um, I started job hopping and running and gunning, and I found myself as a as a as the youngest guy in the room, often by a decade, as a senior leader at a university, and making more money with my with my wife. She was a researcher and a professor than we could have ever dreamed. And um, dude, <laughs> I fell apart. I was spending 24 or 367 in hospitals with students and then working on budgets and staff and running this, uh, my part of the university all day. And ultimately that started, the wheels started wobbling on the car because I never changed the oil and I never rotated the tires. Right. Yep. And, um, I got really curious about what happened to me. So I never had a big break. I didn't end up in some mental institution. We did end up taking a $70,000 household pay cut. I went to another university. And I went back to grad school again. I'd graduated with a PhD years ago. I thought I was some fancy pants. I went back to school. I just had to know what happened to my brain. And what I came to find out is that, man, we live in a electrified system that we call normal. Yep. And we're told that we can do everything by ourselves. And we're told to keep grinding and going and going and grinding. And that we're judged by the worst things that have ever happened to us, the worst things we've ever done and that we don't we're never in control of anything and we just have to trust our I mean, it just became this insanity and so um one day on the radio i was hosting a show with dave ramsey and i popped some guy called about anxiety and i said dude that's not even the problem the problem is all this other stuff anxiety is just an alarm man telling you that you're not all right and and during a break dave looked and said we're gonna write a book on that and so there you go that's what it was and so it was really me popping off I, I didn't understand outside of academic circles. Um, I started seeing it my students over and over. Man, anxiety, we're trying to solve this anxiety issue and it's not the problem. It's a signal letting us know that the way we are living, man, we are not okay. 
And there's so much there. And I mean, so <laughs> I could do a whole nother show with you about what I, I want to do this series called Out of the Matrix because you've stepped out. Yes. And, and having a mom and dad that showed you early on, that's what I'm trying to be to my daughters who are college age right now. They're in school. And I just had this long conversation with my youngest. You know what? Look, you see these houses around you. Those people didn't choose them. The house chose them. Society chose that house for them. And they don't even know it. And you're not going to do that. I'm going to tell you why. And of course, a lot of times I think, dad, you're a nut. Okay, whatever you say, you know, they just get through it. But how cool, because one of the things you talked about was that there is no defined timeline on a human being. And I'm just, I mean, I'm 46 years old and I started a podcast a couple of years ago and started creating content to, to do things that drive my passion. So fantastic there, but all right, put a pin in that. That's for the next time I get you on Let's this it, time. So one of the things I want to dive into, because you just said it's an alarm. Anxiety is an alarm. And what I love about this book and to the listener, if you, if you saw my book review, I told everyone out there, read this book. If you have even a twinge of anxiety and who doesn't right now, we're about to see hyperinflation. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're with Dave Ramsey. I'm sure he's going to, that's going to be a big topic. We're gonna have to deal with it. We've had COVID. It, these have been anxious times. And this book, you dive so much into not just the quote unquote worry of anxiety, but as an alarm. And then you get into the science and how you can, how mindfulness, breathing techniques the you know, and, and one of the things you said there, we often feel anxiety where in our stomach. Well, and most people don't realize that we have more neurotransmitters in our gut than we do up top. So that's that signal. So you get to this point where you, you write the book, tell me, and obviously, two doctorates my gosh that's crazy that would make anybody <laughs> I don't have a, jason i don't have a lot of friends man it's cool oh, but but you've <laughs> got to be just a killer researcher so tell me how as you started researching for this topic or maybe you knew it and that was just the first time you organized it in one format like this tell the listener how what they should understand about anxiety okay the alarm goes off mm. now what what do i do so the way i would the, the way I would describe it is this, the way, what we do with anxiety in our, in our culture is this. Um, imagine you're in your kitchen and your smoke alarm's going off and you bring over um, a therapist, you bring over a friend that you trust or some loudmouth in-law and, or some pastor, or some, I don't know, we got 18 associate pastors at every church now. Um, you bring somebody over and you guys are up on a ladder and you're trying to figure out how to get the batteries, how to shut the alarm off. And your house is burning down around you. And you think that's the problem, right? So backing out, man, if you just said it, we should feel anxious right now. Everything's chaotic, right? Six months ago, we had people storming the Capitol. Six months before that, we had this politic thing, this, we had overseas. It is a bananas time. And on top of that, we don't sleep. We, we've had a year where we thought we controlled a lot until suddenly this tiny little bug that nobody could see just shut everything down, right? And these are anxious seasons that we're in. And so we should feel anxious. That's okay. It's when we go about trying to duct tape pillows to that alarm and calling that solved that you end up getting in, in trouble because the house is still burning, right? Yep. So getting out of that thing and saying, hey, what is that alarm trying to tell me right now? And it almost always, outside of some rare medical issues, um, Anxiety alarms tell you you're disconnected. You found yourself alone. So think back 10,000 years ago, you open your eyes and your tribe had moved on without you. You're probably going to die, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got natural alarms telling us, hey, you are al alone. And if you're like me, I perfected the art of being alone in a crowded room. I could be alone next to, I've been married for almost 20 years. I could be alone in bed next to my wife. I, I can be alone around a lot of people. The second thing is, is you're in a situation that you can't control. And that's all of us right now, right? We can't yep. control any of this stuff. And the third one is your alarms are telling you that you're in a situation where you're not safe. And we've entered a media ecosystem, a media matrix, if you will, to be drum dramatic. And I love being over dramatic. Yeah. Um, dude, if, if, if media can activate our amygdala, if it can make us scared, then it makes us have to run and fight things. We don't fight as a culture. We don't run anymore. And so one way we can get some cheap dopamine hits is to buy stuff, mm -hmm. is to solve that. Mm -hmm. And so our media matrix has a vested interest in us staying on edge, being worried about the next thing coming because we will click on things, we will zoom in on things, and we will buy things as a way to heal ourselves 
for them to get to tomorrow and then to get to the next day and the next day and the next day. So stepping out of all that and shutting the screens off and looking at real people and saying, hey, what can I control and not control and focusing on those things? Man, your alarms say, okay, cool. We've done our part here. And they begin to, over time, naturally shut off. Um, going back to, I silenced mine for so long. I would, when it, man, when I get anxious, I thought, well, I should probably just get another department to run and I should get a new job. I need to make more money. Oh, I need to get a, 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 become a professor too. I started adding stuff. And so I ended up, that, that was just me duct taping it, right? Um, ultimately, I had to step back and say, dude, what are these alarms trying to tell me? Yeah. And then rebuild from there. So one of the things I want to ask you, because I want to jump into where I, you know, that, that power statement that I mentioned. Okay. So I can take it that all right, I, I'm feeling anxious. And, and I, you know, I've read that, that one of the, the ways that we prove we're still in control, even if it's with a credit card, even if it's with taking out a second mortgage, that kind of feeling we're in control uh, caused us to go, we buy something. Like, okay. I can still acquire things. So I'm not completely out of control. So that's some duct tape buying stuff. Get, keeping yourself busy that's duct tape now isolating duct tape, I, yeah exactly so yeah. would you consider medication duct tape because here's the thing that i just that i thought was so very powerful here's one of the things you write that i thought was just it, it really kind of woke me up because i mean we can all go back to the famous Tom Cruise, Matt Lauer interview where they started trying to talk oh, yeah. about medication and it went really bad, really quick. I think yeah. you do a fantastic job of describing how medication can be in your toolkit, but, and here, and here's what you write. I found medication very helpful to turn down my body's anxiety alarms so I could actually do the work. And then you talk about meeting your mentors and that sort of thing. So to that listener out there that's like, well, hey, you know, the first thing my doctor did was put me on some uh, some Xanax or, or whatever the case may be, you know, talk about medication as you see it as part of your journey and how people should manage that. Yeah, um, and, and you, you did a great job there. I always want to be sensitive with this conversation yep. because A, I'm not a licensed medical doctor and B, um, everybody's individual physiology and body chemistry is unique okay ultimately what i know is this that when they introduce psychotropic medications and as they have continued to increase exponentially year over year over year we are seeing no decrease in fact we're seeing the opposite we're seeing a mass acceleration of depression anxiety and some of these core um what we would just call mental health challenges and so to suggest that medication is the solution, or what I would say to call anxiety or depression a disease, I think is a misclassification of it. It's a, it's, it's a unfair representation of what's actually going on. I'm not broken most of the time when my anxiety alarms are going off. They're doing their job. Or if I can't run or I can't fight, the next thing I can do is freeze. My body will shut me down to save my life, right? And it may take it, the bear may eat my arm off and my leg off, but it's just going to think I'm dead and it's going to move on and then I can get away, right? So it will depress stuff for me. So all that to say is ultimately I had to get to a place where I, I ignored my alarms for so long. We've all been in those buildings where the fire alarms are so sensitive. They go off like when you're cooking a meal or when you're, when you're, uh, you know, shower's too hot and the mm -hmm. steam sets it off. That's what happened to, to my alarms. Ultimately, I just ignored them for so long. They became so hypersensitive everything would spin off my anxiety stuff. So dude, medication was really important for me. It was, uh, I hate to use this word because it, it's no one uses it fairly. It was a bandaid. It helped stop the bleeding. It didn't heal that wound. I still had to go get stitched up. I still had to take time off from playing whatever, right? I had to go heal. And so medication is a good, it, it turns it down, man. And so I can go to a counselor and actually hear somebody. So I can start exercising so I can start taking care of my body, meet with, start eating right. And those kind of things that can help me ultimately heal from the inside out. So I don't think it's, um, we live in an either or culture. This isn't an either or thing. Um, I'm also relatively outspoken against benzos and just because they have such a high addictive quality to it for so many folks and SSRIs are different, but um, man, I had a lot of benefit. And here's my rule of thumb. I will not put a pill in my mouth if I don't have a plan I loved that. 
yep. to never to, to, to ultimately get off of it. Right. Yep. And so, um, so far that's been effective for me and the, the folks that I, I know well. Right. And I, I, that's one of the things I loved when, that you actually put in the book. You're not going to put a pill in your mouth without having an exit strategy. And I think that is, I think that's good for the listener to understand. It's like, you're not saying you're anti, you're saying, Hey, it's just part of an overall plan. And then turning that noise down is huge. And then you said something right there. That is a perfect segue into my favorite line that you wrote in the entire book. You said it allowed you to start doing the work from the inside out the work came from within and here's what you write that i wrote for the first time ever in a margin of any of my books i've taken notes on power statement in almost every situation medication is not a long-term solution to anxiety you are mm. dude that's that's a <laughs> that was just that the whole concept of at the end of the day it lies within us to make whatever the change is and it sounds kind of cliche or whatever and you know instagram quotey but i'm all about the instagram quotes if i've got some, <laughs> if i've got a story to back it up and you know gandhi famously said be the change you want to see in the world and it goes back to jordan peterson telling people to clean your room before you go out and change the world or um uh, admiral I'm drawing a blank. McNerney. I think make that's your wrong. bed. Yeah, yeah. Make your bed. It's yeah. and so it's kind of the same thing. Is you know ultimately, it's not outward in. It's it's like finding that joy versus the, the temporary happy. It's it starts yeah. in here and and that's one of the things that I love so much about this book that I on my book review I said this should be considered uh, because it is short. I mean, look, it's less than seventy pages in, and so it's like a handbook. For someone i'm serious yeah, i like that i like that it is a handbook for someone that is dealing with anxiety because you give them the greatest partner in this walk which is what lies within themselves and so and then i love this Thanks, just man. oh yeah no seriously it's powerful and then just because someone gives the dragon a name this is why i love this one too just because someone gives the dragon a name doesn't mean the dragon gets to move in and live with you talk about that a little bit mm. man <laughs> Well, number one, thank you for all that. I've never had a power statement in my life. Usually my wife and kids are telling me to shut up. <laughs> so that's awesome. I'll take it. Um, man, we are real big on classifications and labels. And I like to, I think it's a much more valuable, it's a much more historically accurate way of looking at life in seasons. Um, I take so many calls on my radio show. Somebody will call and say, Hey, I'm really struggling with depression. I'm struggling with this. My marriage is a wreck. And I'll just back out and say, how old are you? And they'll say 26. Say, tell me about your life. I got three kids under the age of four and I'll just stop them right there and go, yeah, your life is like, is, 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 is a, a human hurricane blender, dude. There is trying to, to classify you as broken when you got four kids crapping everywhere and running around and not <laughs> sleeping course it's a mess right so we have these seasons and we've just got so uh label happy so there is something about when my buddy who's a medical doctor i went and sat with him for a couple hours and i wept and i was the first time i'd been open with somebody about what i was struggling with and he said man you're not doing okay and if i was going to do diagnostics here's what i would diagnose you with and we named the dragon and then it was that's not you though that's a season you're in that's the your house is on fire right um, we're going to work through that. We're not going to focus on the alarm. We're going to go put the fire out. And so, yeah, coming back to yourself, here's where that gets really hard, man, because some of us have to decide. I made it all the way to associate vice president and I realized I'm not cut out for this mm -hmm. or I'm not a great person. I'm not the right person to be up 24, seven, 365, or man, I should probably find a job where I make 75,000 instead of 115,000 and then join the softball league. And actually go to my kids' baseball games because that's that's more that's gonna bring me more joy than this artificial external stuff, right? And so it's finding that that place, you gotta grieve it, man. I had this picture of what my life was gonna be. I was gonna be a college president, I was gonna look like this, I was gonna drive this car and make this much money. And I got real close to that and realized I don't want that life. And I didn't have a backup, I didn't know what was next. I didn't know, I didn't have another plan, right? It yeah. sure was it to be a podcaster, dude, right? I didn't have another plan. And so everything falls apart when you get way out on that into that tree limb and you realize, oh, I don't, that's too high to jump. I can't get back. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's being able to do the hard, hard work saying, 
hey, I'm in an abusive relationship. Hey, this guy I trusted when I was a kid, he put wounds and scars in me that will be there forever. Mm-hmm. And I get to choose whether I'm going to do the hard work and heal from that or I'm going to carry that around. Yeah. I got to see some gnarly trauma and I'm either going to own that as a badge and not sleep anymore and, 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 or I'm going to every day decide I'm going to heal from that and do the things I know that I need to do to be healthy and surround myself with people who can help me out in those days and seasons when I don't have the energy or the willpower, whatever the word you want to put in there. I don't have the strength to do it on my own. That's why we have community, right? It's you have a gang of people that walks through life with you. I've got to do those things in this imaginary accumulate, do it all by yourself. Man, it's just not real. It's not real. I love it. I love it. And all right, now I want to shift gears a little bit because so most of what we've talked about is there's been a triage. We're figuring out, you know, all right, what's causing the pain? You're, you're, you're hurting. You came to the hospital. Something hurts. Now we found out what it is. But to me, so much of life and what, what blows my mind, man, is how few people are proactive with wellness. And it's not just, you know, watching your cholesterol, you're keeping your VO2 max, you know, at a certain <laughs> level. It's not just all about that. It's about this, these, this thing, this amazing piece of hardware that we have between our ears that impacts so much of what we do in every facet of our life. And you wrote this, and, and look, I, there was a time where if you and I were to sit down and talk, I would, if, if you were to say, Jason, so what's the thing that really bothers you the most about yourself? I mean, it would have been a long list, but one of them would have certainly been is hit this. I look on the past with too much nostalgia Mm -hmm. i look to the future with anxiety and i completely dismiss and disregard the present i just Mm -hmm. don't even pay attention to it i'm I'm either everything that happened before was either two things it was a battle between the mistakes i'd made career-wise i should have took this job or should have done that or man it was so wonderful when the girls were that age the future i've got to get these things done because when i'm sitting you know 45 46 year old jason i want to be doing this and then life is passing me by and you right here we waste so much time planning for greener grass that we don't breathe the air of our current mornings so for the listener out there who maybe maybe the alarm starting to kind of do one of those cool app things where it's just like it, it wakes you up silently like the light comes on i mean we got all kinds of cool alarms now versus just <laughs> bah, bah, you know uh, but they kind of hear that sunrise alarm a little bit of anxiety or maybe things are going pretty well but they need the, but they've never even un- thought about mindfulness meditation i was doing a box breathing before you came on you know I'm, I'm about to talk to freaking dr john deloney i gotta get myself calmed down here you know no you're good so talk about that and how people can prepare themselves to hopefully be ready should the anxiety come to deal with it in the most productive way i think the the honest answer is you've got to figure out what are the things that zero you out what are the things that keep you whole and healthy? And if you explore that curiously and not judgmentally, it's a fun process and it's a exciting process because you get to know yourself. And it sounds all woo woo and cheesy and whatever. Um, I'm a Texas cops kid, man. There's, I'm the last person that's going to be like, you do you know what you need to <laughs> I don't know, whatever. But I, so this isn't a woo woo thing. This is waking up, whether you have a whoop strap or an aura ring, or you just get to know your body really well. I had, today was deadlift day for me. Mm. I'm in the middle of writing a big book that is taking my soul from me. And I'm having to go back in through some dark stuff that I haven't been through in about a decade just to replay it. And today was, today was deadlift day. And dude, I'm the guy that's always like, dude, don't scoop. I'm that guy. What an idiot. And dude, I went out and jogged around in my yard i live on some acreage out here in the woods in tennessee i went out and just barefoot ran in my grass for about a half hour that's what i needed today and i didn't beat myself up over it i did something i didn't just lay around i also did my regular morning practice and so um it's about knowing what what you need today what you need over a week what you need over a month and knowing who you can turn over accountability to who someone's going to call and check on me and say, Hey, you being a bum dude. Are you just laying around? Are you doing the things you need to, that's going to be, help me be accountable. Right. Yep. And so 
It's grabbing those things you can control and let the other stuff just go, man. And like you said, we beat each other up. We beat ourselves up. Dude, we talk to ourselves. I'm going to get all fired up about this. I talk to myself in a way regularly that if I heard somebody say that to what, the way I talk to myself to a woman at a cash register, I'd go to jail because yep. I'd knock that dude's teeth out of the back of his head. It, yep. Like in, I would smile on the way, like, right? And the cop would pat me on the back, right? But I talk to myself like that all the time. What a loser. I can't believe you did that. You're going to wait this long. You're procrastinating again. Of course you are because you're a sucky dad. Hey, remember when you're a middle schooler and you hurt that kid because you hurt kid? Right? It just, it's that loop that just goes and goes and goes. And so I think we over spiritualize and over sentimentalize mindfulness. It's just getting mm -hmm. control of your thoughts, man. Yeah. Saying I can practice to control my thoughts. I can, even if I don't want to, if I don't quote unquote feel like it, I'm not, I'm not passionate about it can get up and go exercise and if i can't exercise i can go walk today i did call a mentor on the way to work this morning because i was going to be on the texas podcast with jason i was super nervous about it so i called a mentor of mine randall hey check in how are you doing how's your family how's my family those are basic practices that i know hey look check this out this isn't even part of like a shtick look at this you want me to show you my famous uh my fancy app i have for keeping everything together it's this no card love it this is what i woke up this morning and wrote as a part of my just morning journaling and prayer time, this is what I got to do today. And I am marking through podcast at 10 a.m. Studio 2 with you, right? This is how I just keep track of my day. This is what I can control today. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Right? This and my attitude. That's it. And so if it's not on this, if it's not my attitude, I'm not going to worry about it. I can't do anything about it. I love that. You know, one of the things that you said there about, because I am, I'm that guy too, that like whatever the discipline is, I don't care how I feel, I'm going to do the workout that day. And Ben Greenfield, who you probably are, are, are aware of, I, you yeah, know, I know ben, yeah. okay. Yeah. So Ben actually is someone that gave me permission to, you know, not only to say, and I don't know Ben personally, I'm just by following him. I, I want to meet him one day just to say thank you, because he's the one that said, Hey, you're probably doing more harm than good if you're just grinding it and going balls to the wall every single day. You're 46. Your body needs to heal. You're not training for an Ironman. And so, and you know, it's, it's, that, that's it. Hey, that's it, Jason. All, if you ask yourself this question, for what? Yeah. What's for it what? for? Right. Right. What, what am I like for what? I'm going to stay another 30 minutes and do four more emails and miss my, the first two innings of my son's literally game for what? Yeah. Yeah. And can I right. tell you, can I tell you that I used to like the, the, we were talking about uh, Josh and Ryan or Josh and Ryan, we said, mentioned the minimalist uh, approach before we got on. And, you know, one of the things they talk about is like keeping these, having these aspirational goals, like keeping some clothes just in case you happen to get invited by, you know, Dr. John Deloney to head to BVI to hop on a boat. You know, you got to keep that swimsuit and that perfect Cuban shirt. You've got to keep it just in case Dr. John calls. <laughs> And that's the way I was about my workouts. Well, mm. I'm probably never going to be chased by a bear or run an Ironman, but if it happens, I want to be ready. <laughs> I'm guy. Yeah. Just these silly things we tell ourselves. It's crazy. And when that moment actually happens, your body will be so stressed. You'll blow out both ACLs and you'll wreck your bike. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's going back and answering that question for what here was an awesome thing. So one of my anxiety triggers is finance right? Is mm. it's Dang. this big ghost of a thing that I cannot do anything about. Yeah. I can be handle my relationships. I can help be a leader in my community. I can take care of my spiritual life. I can be a great husband, father. I cannot do anything if the federal government decides to keep printing money. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything about, I cast my vote. That's what I got, right? I can't do anything if, you know, fill in the blank when it comes to finance stuff. If um, some kid with a laptop just shuts everything down. If some kid's with laptops and bent big, I can't do anything about that. And so it, it spins me up. And I, one of my oldest friends in the world is a, is a fancy pants banker in the state of Texas. And we were having dinner one night and I was going through all this stuff. And he finally stopped me and said, dude, I don't owe anybody any money. I'm a banker, but I don't owe anybody any money. And my house is paid for. And I don't have, this is what he said. I love it. I don't have a meteorite plan, man. If we get to the moment where we're trading coffee and cigarettes and bullets for food, <laughs> it won't look like it does today. And I'll deal with that when we get there. Right. Yeah. And I remember that line goes through my head all the time. That for what line, for what, for what? Because a meteorite, we'll deal with that when we get here. 
Mm -hmm. until then, I'm going to, Dave, my boss always says, man, I read the tortoise and the hare every year. And every year the tortoise wins the race again, Yeah, wins the race again. And Dave will tell you, Dave is stupid wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wild wealthy. He could be wealthier, but he'll tell you, I own all my money. Yeah. I own all my real estate and all my cash and I'm not leveraged. And so I sleep at night Yeah, and I hang out with my friends and we laugh deeply because I don't have that other, you know what I mean? Didn't have that, yeah. that constant. So it's, it's just backing up and slowing down saying, what are we doing? And yeah. what I'll tell you is I've worked with high performers, with elite military folks, with the fanciest of the fanciest, professional athletes, everybody. There is no external plug to an internal hole. It does not exist. Mm. And when you're on the front end of something and you think, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just, I'm telling you, please listen, it doesn't exist. It's not real. Wow. So what you got to do is create where you want to head, not cars and homes and all that. Actually take the time to draw that picture out. What do you want to be doing? Not riding on a boat. Do you want to be laughing? Do you want to be outside? Do you want to have people around you that you're cracking up? Y'all are being silly. You're like, and then reverse engineer that. Yeah. Right. And now you're talking about joy. And usually you can get there making $55,000. You don't need to make 550 million, right? You can get there. And um, it's much more attainable than this constant moving finish line that just makes us anxious and anxious and anxious and anxious. And anxious. Right. Well, I can tell you this, um, and this is not false flattery. Uh, please don't take it as that, but to the listener out there, um, this, you know, it's not like I'm getting rich off, you know, my podcast. That's not what this is about, but I can Me tell neither. you, it, right. But I can tell you this, that when I made the decision to start focusing on the things that, that not only brought me joy, but that I could do that. I, I truly believe you know, that the motto of this show and all of them, everything I do is to improve always in all ways. And it's, it, it has a selfish endeavor with a very uh, civic byproduct, Dr. John, it's this. Mm. I believe that if I can be the absolute, I mean, just crushing it version of myself, whatever that is, like what John Wooden used to coach his players to, if he, he always thought if I could just coach them to be as close to, to reach their close to their potential as possible, we'd win games. Mm -hmm. I think if I can coach myself to be as close to my potential as possible, everyone around me will win. The fruit of that will spill over. And folks, yeah. listen, here, when I made this decision, here I am talking to I, Dr. John Deloney, having an incredibly rich, valuable conversation, doing something I absolutely love. And you, the listener, you get to benefit because you get to hear from him through this little platform of a podcast that, you know, just when you start to focus on what's real, that was in my control. Being able to go wake up and go like Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy, Jason, right? Wake <laughs> up going, I will make more money today. No, that doesn't really yield much. But to be able to say, you know what I can do, though? I can go establish great relationships, pursue things I love, try to get better and better and better at it. And boom, here I am visiting with my fellow Texan, Dr. John Deloney, who has taken his time. And I know we've run over a little bit. You've got a, another gig you got to get to. And I want to be respectful of that, but it works, man. And I, I, from the bottom of my heart, I don't try to pretend like I'm good at this or like this is no big deal. I'm, I'm transparent. This is a huge deal for me. You've been mm -hmm. where I am, starting it off, trying to get, get out there and do the right thing. And so for you to take the time to come on my show to James Quandall, who connected us, my, my, my friend, that iron that I get to sharpen iron with every other mm -hmm. week. Thank you, James. Dr. John, thank you, brother. This was great. And I want you to, you know, any parting words with anyone listening who might be dealing with anxiety, dealing with mm -hmm. some struggles, or just anything else, brother, I'll leave it to you. Number one, thank you so much, dude. It's, it's, um, I feel, uh, yeah, you're, you're a saint. I'm grateful for you, man. Thanks. Um, you're, you, I wouldn't know that you just started this. You're really good at this. So keep, keep, keep partying. That's awesome. Thanks. Man. Um, it, here's the parting words. If you're feeling anxious, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You could get healthy. And I want everyone to know there's a light at the end of that tunnel. And it's hard and it's messy and it takes years, um, but you're not broken. And the second thing is, is you, the listener, you, Jason, you, John, I got to remind myself this. Dude, we're worth being well. Hmm. We're worth getting off the treadmill and 
and live in somebody else's dreams of accumulation and more and faster and angrier and defining ourselves by who we all hate together versus what we're for. We're worth being well. Our kids are worth that. Our spouses are worth that. Our friends are worth that. Our neighborhoods are worth that. And there is so much peace and laughter and joy and communal struggle together if you can put that other nonsense down. But don't get me wrong, Jason. I'd love to have a jet. That'd be cool, right? I want to pay my house off. That's all good. But that's a byproduct of, as you mentioned, the process. Doing the little stuff right every day. Loving my wife. And if it doesn't ever come to it and I have to fly commercial forever, uh, we'll be fine. All right. And I'm not going to buy a jet anyway. But oh, it's you know you get what I'm saying. Absolutely. It's worth being well. That's it, man. Thank you so much for having me. You're a saint, brother. I'm grateful for you. I love talking to Texans. And if you are a Texan, listen to this. For all that is holy. I love Tennessee, but their Mexican food is not great. Go get some chips and queso for me and take a cheat day on, on Deloney. Appreciate that, man. Awesome, brother. All right, sit tight. Let me say goodbye real quick.